say that I'm a nervous today. No, I'm, I'm going in. I can't sit here without this glass of the off. I'm probably here with some of these guys. And the other thing too is, uh, this is actually the first time I've ever been you know, on a program with my brother. I've seen her speak before. This is just uh, incredible. I would like to tell you that I call her everything she knows. <laughs> I don't know what she knows. That's why they glance at me at this point. I think when, you, when she reads, when you will discover that um, there's a certain kinship between what I do and what she reads on social media. It's very, very serious with her work. So um, the other thing I would really, really, really like to thank this museum. This museum has been really, really incredible. That's just not because they put up this exhibition. But the fact is what they have done, this is the most professional thing I've been involved with in ages. One thing I really like about them, they say we would do this if it's done. If they can't do it, it's a little, you know it's not going to get done. So you always know where you stand. So I'm really honored to have been asked to, to be a part of this. And I, and I can't say too much about the city. The city has really just embraced me, the show, and it's just taken me to a whole other level of how I think about I always think about people and things about the place, you know. So I'm really happy about, about that. Um, this show, in your experience, was designed pretty much around women and children. And it's not being opportunistic. I grew up, I think, if you read any of the documentation, you'll find that I'm very deeply involved with that. That's how I was raised. My mother was uh, really a month of time from uh, February education that insisted that we get educated. She left the South to come home so that she could make sure we did. So, and I grew up in a neighborhood in Alabama, this small concave of, of black, black families surrounded by some of the most household elements you'll find in the South. This was during the time of Lloyd Wallace, and some of you might go to But this, this is during that, that period of time. So we was always surrounded, and we always knew that there was pressure on us, you know, to, to, to uh, watch out for ourselves. But what really took care of me and the children in that neighborhood was the women. If anybody know about, about how these things work, men sometimes are so far under pressure that quite often we cave. You know, we, we find ways to, to avoid issues, we find ways to, to forget them, we drink too much, we abuse too much, we do all kinds of things. But the people that's left there is those women. And what they, they, they did for me, really, is watch over me, kept me out of trouble, pushed the monsters away, until I was able to invite them in on my own, you know. But um, <laughs> they ensured that I understood who they were and how they were to be respected. And that's all I've ever tried to do. I spent this, this work in New York is meant to talk about, about that what they meant to me, what they trained me, and how it helped me to, to raise my own children. I have two daughters that I'm extremely proud of. One is in, uh, in China, working down there. She likes travel. And um, they have the same affinity for people that my, my mothers and my women and my family had. You know, they're, 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 they're very um, this, like I said, this show was designed we talk about that. It's also, it's kind of the same amount of politics and also. Um, it's also designed, because one thing I like when I look around here is all these spaces, all these different cultures. And for a lifetime, and it's been a decently long lifetime, you know, <laughs> but uh, I'm saying what so. For a lifetime, I've been trying to find a way to talk to any and everybody that sees my work. And this is the first time that I really got comfortable to actually understand that because people in the past few have come out, oh, this is just so well done. I love the way you do this, I love the way you do that. But what I'm hearing now is I was so moved, you know. And that's God, you don't know how that makes me feel. I mean I just feel like brand new money, you know. <laughs> but um, I bet I'm really, 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 really happy and I'm grateful to the city for what they have done for me and the support that you've offered me. Now, um, I think for some reason, there's a lot of things in this show. This crowd is yelling in front of these. That's what this was saying you want to talk about. <laughs> it seems like everybody's sitting there in front of these. Uh, this is called. Uh, 
Enduring Spirits. This whole show. This species is called, uh, uh, I'm going to call it an endangered species. <laughs> I'm going to look at it sometime. <laughs> I have to see the moment. That is called endangered species. That, that point is re emphasized by the fact that this little boy here, you have a really good side look at him up here, but as it comes down, it starts to fade. That's that dilemma that our children face right now. They can either go forward, be strong, or that this society and the world will catch it will be destroyed. So this talks about connection to nature. Uh, there's the honeybee that is considered to be a danger at this point. So, and at the top of there is what we call a baobab tree. A baobab tree is one that goes throughout West Africa. It's considered one of the biggest trees in the world, okay? And it's, you've seen Stephen King, right? You know who this guy is. The trees remind you that they sit up in the landscape all by themselves, like nothing would be associated with them. They sit up there by themselves, and they never have anything on them. Never. You want to, I mean, the bees are supposed to, it's supposed to feed the tree, right? But these trees are forever without anything, and it's mainly because Africans call it the tree of life. The bark is used for medication. The, uh, the fruit is used to feed the, the animals, the stock. And the leaves is used for making a uh, kuka. That's a kind of a soup, draw soup. I remember the all the time I was there. They, they pull it, they just stretch, but they love it. <laughs> and, uh, that mother was uh, was Nigerian. So that's, that's, that's what we're showing that, that connection there. And on either side, it asks the basic question that I bet you every, every woman in here, regardless of color, asks themselves, what's the mother do to take care of and keep her kids safe? That's what makes the, make the, uh, the peace transcend talking just one group of people. Because everybody in here, every woman in this place here, knows that. How do you protect your child? They leave home, they're worse, you know, how old they are. See the beauty of scares me every day. You know, one in China scares me every day. But you have to trust what you're talking about. So, uh, when you look at, at this piece here, these are, these are toys and play things that are we cut off our children. Okay? Paper dolls. Now, what it's actually talking about is that two will stay on the other side of the ball, or the rest of the ball. And the same thing on this side over here. And when you look at down here, these things are, are dropping down. and Truth, truth be, be, be told, that the people that are really, really endangered, I'm not saying white kids are not endangered, they are. All of our kids are endangered here, you know? But black kids are, are, are really falling like, like, a, like a tree on a tree, you know? And so, but what I'm trying to do, I'll say that, but I'm also trying to be optimistic also. If you really study, you've got, you got some, some uh, these, these things on either side that stood up. And that goes back and still arrives and kind of thing that no matter what you do, I will fight you every step of the way to go forward, you know? And uh, I think that's, that's what we have to take now. But this is what this one is basically about. Uh, who's right here? <laughs> you have to bear with me because uh, we've never done this before, you know? And um, when, when she was growing up, <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't want me to talk about it. You know, how am I not going to talk about it? You know, how am I not going to The same way you put my sister in the show and not me. <laughs> 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 my sister made me more. <laughs> but, uh, but she was growing up and she got drunk. She got really, really drunk. And you know, one day she came to me and she said, Dad, I don't want to be an artist. And we've always talked that whatever you want to do to support you on that, to whatever school you want to go to support you on that. So I said, why? She said, well, I looked at you. I said, what do you mean? She said, well, you've been struggling your whole life. It's so hard for you to make a living out of this. She's forgotten that, that this might not be true. This story might not be true. <laughs> the story is true. The story is true. <laughs> story is true. Any, anyway, anyway, she asked what do you want to do. She said, I want to write. I said, OK. What? She supports you. <laughs> but we, we gave you some big support. We never, we never tried to chase you with But this is one that I identify with her on this level here also, too. Of whether she thinks so or not, I identify with what she writes. She, her, her poetry has the same feel for me as my pictures do. So why don't you hear something? Let me get back to talk some more.
recognize that. Uh, I mean, I think the way generations work, we end up all talking about the same things, just in different, hopefully, more nuanced ways as we continue through the generations. Just hopefully, every generation figures it out a little bit more. So, I think I'll just start. And also, thank you for coming, and thank you to the Columbia Museum for bringing me in. Visiting prophets. My uncle pacing the dirt field behind his mother's house, like a car whose tank will not empty. He might as well be in prison, poisoned. We guess bipolar, that maybe the malaria is at it again. If this were America, he would be a boat we could tug beneath the shed during winters, could thaw him without sending word to other seasons. Not even money would stop us from feeding him medicated morsels to bring his mind back in from the rain. At the very least, we could fix his limp. If this were anywhere, we would be hysterical. So long it's been since relief has doubled us over, cried into our stomachs, held our knees to our shoulders. But since this is our homeland, we drive through markets, past Amadou Bello University, where my father taught students to draw the body after mastering the line. In the brunt of a fresh, rainy season, my cousin snakes the car around the roundabout, round beggars using foreign objects as limbs. We are stockpiling mangoes, plantains, a bit more powdered milk, and baobab leaves for kuga. Guards, barely old enough to be lovers, stand in front of gated compounds, avoiding eyes and forgetting the weight of their weapons, forgetting our mothers have died the same way. What do we name this revision of our bodies? Diabetes, hypertension, hepatitis, stroke. I can see how all these guns have helped keep my uncle crazy. Our hunger is anonymous. For three days, my feet continue to swell, splitting the stitching of the boots that took my last $80. Not even Nikes can hold me. Maybe my uncle is on to something, pacing the backyard for his madness. On our mother's dirt roads, we know how dangerous someone who wants to save you can become. Compassion is not the same as repair. Let's say madness has a heart. So this next one is when we, from when we were in high school, we used to live there by the day, and this guy tried to break into her house, but he didn't get it. Um, but like my mother was home, really like, scary stuff. So. The break in. When I close my eyes, I see my mother running from one house to another, throwing her fist at the doors of neighbors, begging anyone to call the police. There are times when every spectator is hungry, times a thief takes nothing, leaves you a fool in your inventory, how one trespass could make all others suddenly invisible. My mother counted her jewelry and called overseas. My father counted women, afraid one of us would go missing. When I close my eyes, I hear my mother saying, ah, ah, this new country. My cousin is cleaning auntie between the clicking line and their tongues. Tonight, the distance between me, my mother, and Nigeria is like a jaw splashed against a wall. I close my eyes and see my father, sulking like a pile of ashes, his hair jet black and kinky, his silence entering a thousand rooms, then outside trimming hedges, as if home were a land just beyond the meadow, the leaves suddenly back. When I close my eyes, I see my mother mean for the rest of the day rolling my back in the tub like she's still doing dishes. This next one is um, part of a series of poems that are all called Paula and just about, you know, girlhood and stuff. 
general stuff. <laughs> and the nineties. <laughs> Paula. Paula says when the moon came out of her, it was like a Whitney Houston song, <laughs> achy and full of high tones. She traces my fingers over the scar, asks, do I want to be beautiful too? Paula sucks on fireballs all day, says she knew the 90s would be like this. I watch as she twists a corner of her t-shirt, rub her finger, and threads it through a hot pink clip, her stomach glowing like a street lamp. Paula calls me late at night, says that this is a dream. I wait to find her in the floorboards, her laugh opening the curtain. She smiles and says the day she was born, she watched God die in a fire. We spend the afternoon mailing flowers to our mothers. Paula leads me to water, says we are the baptism. Together we watch as summer drains the sky. I show her how night lifts the windows, but she says it's just her father's hand. After too much, Paula tells me that sadness is like a girl in a striped shirt. I put this in my book of important things. Ooh. So this next one, I always feel like that I should always say before I read this that this is about my sister's first husband. She has since remarried someone who's much better. <laughs> My brother-in-law recites at the top here. And I would say my mother um, was Muslim and her family is Muslim and my sister is Muslim. So you're going to hear some things about Islam here. And the top here is uh, one of the prayers that they do with Islam. My brother-in-law recites at the top here. In the revolving door of my sister's apartment, my brother-in-law kneels east, palms the Quran. Feet washed, he crosses arms over chest, drowning the days as heavy stones in supplication. My sister, confusing devotion with taking him back, bows by his side. It is a sight that makes my knees buckle. So beautiful and familiar it is to the days I spent prostrate, mimicking our mother's morning prayers. The beads of her misbaha squeezed tightly between my fingers as I sung the 99 names of Allah. The first time my brother-in-law leaves, his shadow of the bed sheets is the braille my sister deciphers her swollen belly across. The second time she comes to sleep in my house, their son at her nipple like a hooked fish. It is winter in Chicago. My brother-in-law, having broken every syllable between them, turns silence into metaphor. My sister prays towards the God of our mother and our memories, a God I hope would rather throw a miracle away than bend an ear towards the wishes of a father who has weaponized leaving. My sister looks out into her life, cooled by the breeze of a door slamming, a man who never looks back, not even when returning. My brother-in-law is home again. I cradle their son in my arms so they can pray. Enough history between us that my nephew comes quickly and reaches towards my chest as if searching for my sister's residue. His eyes so new, they are a prayer. With my nephew in my arms, the only thing between Allah and I are two cans and a string. My brother-in-law's need, a valley, my sister's a mirror. With his eyes wide open, my brother-in-law raises both hands and recites the top beer. The storm in him quelled to a malady. And already I know the next time he leaves, my sister will invite him back into her body. Her temperature just beginning to drop after carrying the weight of two heartbeats. How to bring your children to America. Mothers became targets. 
hanging on clotheslines, the bibs of their fed children. Country born, split in jail. Their first first steps aborting their sisters, brothers, the fresh bread of their love language. The children, the English, tearing their sphincters in two. They came by boat with wings, forgetting their own mother's uterus. They came over and over again until it didn't matter if so and so had died. We were the nicknames escaping their bellies, the translation for stay and never arrived. Their husbands, their uncles, we were their wives, their illnesses, their pauposies, only thing that could save them the sickle cells that knew better than to touch. Visible only in their dialect, they spoke to cousins, wired money, forgave ancestors we couldn't trust. And when they stopped speaking to us in our birth language, we became new dictionaries, became the consonants of the constitution they studied. Our first words forgotten objects in our home countries. They were the ones whose fathers had died without daughters, and the milk of their language. In America, we were memories without accents or consensus, lambs that couldn't be traded for milk, meal, or honey. And oh, how they moaned, how they starved, sucking their teeth between King's English, yelling for us to stop playing immigrant and go get naturalized. about that, that, you know, in the, recently, there's been a lot of talk about immigrants and immigration, but you very, you very rarely ever hear about, you know, what, what you have to leave to take the risk to come here, only to be, you know, declared an enemy of the state, you know? So, you know, just to be thinking about that, the giant sacrifice that people make to just, to come here and struggle and suffer. So, just, you know, keep um, this next one, I'm going to read you. Um, I think this is just about how, you know, generational trauma, you know, how each, each we, when one person does something, however far in the past, how it morphs and stays with people throughout the generations, how it's inherited. I think I wrote this because I was listening to this podcast called On Being, and they had interviewed this this um, psychiatrist had gone to this uh, this community that had the highest concentration of Holocaust survivors to interview like how the trauma worked. But what she found that the people that had the most trauma were the kids that they had in America, um, and that the you know the Holocaust survivors they had to figure out how to deal with their trauma. And that they all showed to this study for um, mothers who were pregnant during 9/11 and found that it actually changed the chemistry of their of the babies, like the stress. So this is, I was thinking about that when I wrote this. My father's terrible. My father leans down the barrel of a shotgun house and looks in both directions. At one end, my great-grandfather is leaking like smoke from my aunt's room, where in her body he has left the smell of fire. At the other end, my grandmother, a bull reluctantly bound to her matador. It is barely a secret that this man is the one thing all the women in my family have in common. My father calls it a night so dark the dark could have been broken. Teaches me the hardest thing is to be loved by a woman you can't protect. My father looks down the barrel of a shotgun house and sees in my grandmother hurt like prayer is a position. He sees how fearing the wrath of God can make you call any angry man king. To this day, my father still hesitates during a storm because once upon a time, thunder that the Lord was working. Has taught his daughters to recognize the mole of a man willing to pay for the whiskey but never the rent. Says to always go for the knees, throat, or eyes. He moves like his whole life depends on superstition. 
sleeps like he's listening for the creaking door that signals my aunt's fire. 72 and tired of secrets, every Christmas my father hands over another, each an heirloom wrapped tightly in his mouth. Lesson one, there's no God in Alabama. Lesson two, where the road forks between faith and survival. Lesson three, my grandmother did the best she could. The kill shot, to leave a wounded thing with its heart still beating. And uh, I think that this is what this series was trying to talk about, is how they've taken something as common as a hood. A hood. And because uh, there are some people that this use a hood, but there are a ton of them that use a suit. There's probably about a thousand dollars to put a red pot, you know? That they are worse than anything a young young man to do. But what they did was they associated that as a bad thing. Then they associated that with black people. So now, I even heard Cubans was saying one time that if you saw a black youth in a in a hoodie, he crossed the street. And there's a lot of people that would do that without even understanding because a good portion of those kids, just like us, when we were kids, we wore crazy stuff. I wore some uh, bell bottom uh, jeans and a red flag when I was a kid. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, those high heel shoes, red, red high heel shoes. I thought I was something special. <laughs> you know, so that, that's what we did when we were kids. We did all kinds of things like that. So uh, to take one item and selectively make it a bad thing associated, make it a bad thing associated with one group of people. Okay? And at the same time, you design hoodies and you sell them for big bucks. So it's, 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 it's a contradiction there. And it's, it's also speaks to a group of people that has no morals. You know? No, no, no more compass, no think about any of that. You know? So with these these first three is what you traditionally see. You see people do this, but uh, not being the type of person like to design everything the same, like you tend to go the number a little bit. But what's common with these three here is there's something covering them out. So if you can if you can make people insecure about almost anything, you can pretty, pretty much shut them up. So this is what those this one is a very interesting young lady. She's nondescript in many ways. Um, but she has this thing over her, her face. So what I've done is apply this line here comes here and connects with that. So it connects much with the mouth. So it becomes another type of muscle. Over here, um, it's the same kind of thing. And, and it's, it's generally a young black male that, you know, that, that, that that's the most hated. And this, it takes a stronger muzzle to shut him up. You know? Now, we're not saying he's doing the right thing or saying the right thing. But he is protesting in his own way, whether it's bad or not. People, we call it acting out. You know, and sometimes my ghost act that also. So this one here, I try to play around with, with words. Uh, you know, the word black is basically, it, within our culture, is a bad word. It's associated with almost everything bad. Very rarely you find something that black is good, black clouds, you know. So I played off the words here, and these are things they feed people, and you start to take that on as part of who you are, you don't even know it. I mean, there have been times when I have to stop myself. Um, when I came back to West Africa, this friend of mine asked me to come to high school and, uh, and uh, to her classes. And when I was in West Africa, I was reading things in the Times. And I didn't realize the Times had a, a different edition. They had one for here and one for Africa. You know? So my thoughts were that the average young black man was dangerous. It's really dangerous. You know? And you're ashamed of it, but it's there. So one day, after I go to school, this kid comes by. And he walks in like this, he's walking like this, you know. <laughs> and he walks in and says, hey, Mr. Jim. And his voice is much more than mine. Hey, Mr. Jim, how you doing? And you know, I'm stepping back because I'm asking my secret about myself. I don't know who this kid is. And I say, yeah, I've been He said, well, I was in the class, and I was, I draw, and I showed him some stuff. And that's the first time I felt truly ashamed of what I was feeling. And I promised myself I would never, ever allow that to touch my mind again. And so far, I've been good at it, you know. But it showed me that you can't be judging people like that, you know. People are just, people and kids are just kids. 
And I'm not going to say kids and that can get, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because I am over that, that folks, you know, but uh, I, I think about it a lot, and this is what this was about. Now, there's something happened in this that uh, I'll tell you about that way not as work sometimes, right? It's, uh, you make big time mistakes, you know? And what we try to do is pretend that a mistake was not a mistake that we planned. <laughs> yeah. and, and we get we get really good at that. You know, so I had, I had done all this work, was hanging all over the house, downstairs, upstairs, and every room on the walls. So I started the frame. So I made all the frames and I got someone to spray them for me. So I put all these things in the frame and I got this one and it's thing coming there to there and stop. And I, I said, well, Ah, that's the balance. I can't do that, you know, because I had all this, this kind of uh, space in there. So I got to think about it, and I got to think about the words of this, so I decided to put a cat in there. <laughs> so I had just read, I had just read that, uh, that cats, black cats, black dogs, are very difficult to get adopted, you know, from shelters, you know. So I got to think about that. So I put this, this almost black cat in there. But I want to show you this, I want this black cast, this, this white cast, this white people, everybody's got the same issue. All of us got the same issue. So put, put that there, and plus we're going to work this black, all black, and I'm going to lost the joy of so we can have to deal with things like that. Some of you guys, right? Yeah. This is one of my students here. <laughs> She's one of my other, another former student back there someplace, uh, and one of the people I, I studied with my we were students together. George, can I have you, George? <laughs> <laughs> this, if you ever see his work, is one of the most incredible artists I've ever met. He's, he's one of the people that actually taught me how important it was to work in art, you know? Because he worked all the time. And that's not really just trying to impress them, you know? <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 it's, it's cool. But over here, um, these contain more about, about design and the problem of the design. So, these are the things I played around with uh, the corner paper. I'm the kind of artist that I can't stand repeating myself too long. When I start a series, the stage of that series, when it, when it just runs out, I work uh, quite a bit from, uh, from uh, my instincts, from my subconscious. There's no joints in these, there's no sketches at all. I don't do sketches for, for work, but I feel I want to work. You know? I'm not saying it's a, that, that's a good thing, but for me, it works for me. Um, most almost everything just developed that you know, it's just that's just you know, and then it finally comes up. Like uh, trying to figure out how to put a frame these people to get those things so they can stay stay this way. The mind is working on it now. I don't think about it. Every once in a while it's popping in. It's not the mind is working, you're doing something else. But this is the way these were were sort of created. This is pan around with uh, torn paper, more three D things. So I'm looking for a way to uh, to keep pushing myself, my work and the concept of my work. Um, I could have, I got fortunate. The will and the museum be something really nice. At first, the show was originally going to be planned upstairs. And Will came down to Charleston Summer Show. He asked me if I was willing to wait a year and we put it downstairs. Oh, please. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, what was really great about that, it gave me time to create because I did not want to show things at Sean and Florence or in a uh, in, uh, 701. So when I got that time, all this stuff was produced in about seven, eight months. Wow. I didn't do anything else. You know, I don't have much of a life beyond this, but this, this is my life. And I enjoy my life. I enjoy doing this. I don't need anything else right now. That's not true, but I'm not going to tell you what I need. <laughs> but uh, so all these things got done with this time. And this one here was a play on every time the police would shoot someone, the first thing they say, I'm going to pray for my life. The guy had run away, he shot a 20 times in the back, and you were breaking your life. So, but I happen to think it's the other way around. It's the other way around. This young kid here should be afraid of his life, because he's the one that's getting shot. So, I switched that and used that these are some people representing uh, bullet holes in the patch. Um, this is a, a cell phone that they use to take pictures of everything now that's no longer working as well as it used to, you know, because they didn't use to it. Now they're trying to have a lawyer write the pictures up. Maybe. This is a one of our kids, kids less book uh, to be a slave. So if they're talking, this kid here is a college student, but he's already labeled as a bad person. I mean, he put that through his head like that, you know? And a lot of the ones that get kill us, they just, they get shot for no reason, you know? I, I think that uh, it's being proven also, too, that it's not just happening like you. 
that if you, if you allow one person in any society to be oppressed, everybody was so oppressed and not in control. So if, you, if we sit and we watch the black youth get killed, then white people are going to get killed also. So no way that it's going to start. It's already happening, you know? And because I bet you right there's a lot of you that I told your kids how to be with these black and white. How do you get them when they, when they, when they, when they stop you? So if, if it was just about black, you wouldn't be telling your kids that. You wouldn't have to worry about it. We know that all of us are dangerous right now because uh, the second form of this country is really, really quite frightening. Really, really quite frightening. Um, these, I was thinking about it. What's the How many you I was thinking about this guy. Right? This guy made a ton of money off uh, black, young blacks. But his thing was he never wanted black people to wear stuff at all. He never said they might give him the money back. You know? <laughs> <laughs> he, he didn't want to break. So I was trying to really, really design something that uh, no one has seen before. So when, when I'm doing this work, that's what I'm thinking about all the time, that I don't want to bore you. I don't want you to come in here and see something you saw at another show over and over again. So uh, I try to keep everything fresh. And I think what I've done with this show here, the thing that's, that touches me more about the show, like I said, is that Everybody who sees the show, all I hear is, I was so moved. And I, I tell you, that moves me too, you know, because it's what I've been trying to figure out how to do that to make people feel. Because I've always insisted to myself that anyone that views my work has to feel. You cannot walk past my work and not feel something. I don't care what they feel. they got to feel something. But I think what happens to us nowadays is that um, our society teaches us not to care. Like anybody else. You know, you might care that this is going Facebook to talk about it for a minute, but as far as you get involved in trying to save someone, we don't, we don't do that anymore. We, we see things happen to our children. And I think this might be one of the places, one of the places where it happens so badly, you know, to our children, you know, the brutality that uh, happens to them, and also women. And so that that scares, scares me that we we'll look at this, oh, that's all that would happen, you know? And you turn around and you turn the TV, go and do something else. It's not that you don't care. It's just that they're normalizing things, you know, and we really need to be to care for that and worry about that. So that's what I try to do. I try to make sure that if you see my work, you're going to feel something. You just not want to walk by. Because I, I don't want you to walk past my work and do this. You know, that's, that's it. That doesn't say anything about you. It says something about me. It meant that I failed. You know, and I take that quite seriously. If I fail to get my point across, I don't try to make you see what I see. What I try to do is to show you my point of view and allow you to, to go where you want to go based on your experiences. You know, so if you look at that, and you know, I'm talking about women and children, you look at that and you find a way into it. You know, but if I'm lucky, it takes a very positive direction. All right, so I'm going to close on four of poems that are part of the series, and I think after what my dad said, it's good poems to end on. So all these poems are called Testimony, and they're all written um, either about or from the voice of an unarmed black person who was killed by the police. Um, and I wrote these because in, you know, 2014, I don't know if you remember, was an insane year of just left and right people like, dying, black people dying on camera. Um, you know, 2014 was Eric Garner, Michael Brown, and Tamir Rice, you know? So that, that's just a crazy span of time for, for that to happen. Um, and so, you know, as my dad said, it's, it's very easy, it's easy, I think all of us, regardless of race, internalized racism, internalized bias. And especially, you know, as a woman, we are taught that, you know, meant to be wary of men because it's a safety thing. And so you compound that with like internalized racism and blackness and it becomes this very, very like challenging thing that you have to train yourself to overcome. Um, so I wrote these poems just kind of like imagining the interior, like what is the interior lives of these people? Because we actually just didn't get to see the interior lives of these people, especially not the way they were talked about. Even, I read something where Tamir Rice was described as a 12 year old man, which is insane. If you look at his face and you just, it's the face of a baby. And I don't know if any of you recently saw the movie Get Out. It's a really good movie, but one of the things they talked about is what makes that movie so remarkable is that in that movie, that's the, one of the first times you like on in the big screen that you ever get to see a black man afraid. 
So, so before that in media, black people, especially black men, don't have the emotion of fear, which that dehumanizes them and so it makes them easier to kill. So, um, and it, it, when, when they can't feel fear, that makes them always the threat. When actually, if you think about it, black people are walking around scared all the time. I remember, like, you know, during the rash of these killings, I was in Brooklyn and there was, during some of these times, like, they had upped the police presence. And I would see like a group of police like hanging out in the corner, and I remember thinking, okay, how do I pull my hands out of my pocket in a way that doesn't freak them out? You know, and I know that's not a thing that you know the average white American is worried about. You know, that they just pull their hands out of their pocket, and I'm just like, can I have my cell phone? Because how many times has a cell phone been seen as a weapon? I don't know if you guys remember Amadou Diallo. He had a cell phone. How many times did he did he get shot? I mean, yeah. So these these are poems that are related to that. And so these are all people, so it's about their deaths. So this first one is uh, for Eric Garner. Testimony for Eric Garner. Daylight and they dug their fingers into my rectum. Was it intimacy? Was it search or seizure? At marker 433, I become a broken bridge, a wound beneath the belly of a city wolf. Judge, they censor the air, and I see my son's faces. This love is blue-collar work, this exile heritage. I don't regret the kings I've made, though police keep messing up, keep kicking down the door inside me. Judge, the master's tools burned our cribs down. My sons search mirrors for suspicious activity. Marker 440, the hourglass imitates me. The wolf multiplies. Look at us, judge. Confused lovers. Intimate knees. So close come marker 503. Judge their skin. It takes my breath away. Mm -hmm. Testimony for Michael Brown. Officer, for hours I laid there, the sun at my back, my blood running a country mile between the pavement and the crown of my head. No ambulance ever came. It took a long time to cover my body. There are politics to death, and here politics performs its own autopsies. My aunties say things like, boy big and black as you, then the prosecution rests. My neighbors never do. They lose sleep as the National Guard parades down Canfield. I heard my blood was barely dry. I heard there were soldiers beating their shields like war cries. My boys holding hands to hold on through their tear gaps. I heard my mother wander the streets, her body trembling between the sign of a cross and a fist. I heard a rumor about riots got started. Officer, I heard that after so much blood, the ground develops a taste for it. Testimony for Sandra Bland. After the miscarriage, you moved to Walter County, wearing the ghost of motherhood and wanting to make old wounds foreign. In my bedroom, I read aloud the list of your contusions. Watched an officer drag you from your car over and over again. As if the humiliation can never be done, there were typos in your autopsy report. The words, no signs of struggle. I thought, my body is your body, is a temple on fire, is a blinded mask, is a jail cell, is light as a paper bag, is the sound my father makes when after so many years, he says my mother's name. They split you open on the same land, slaves grew cotton at the banks of the Brazos, and the students at Prairie A&M can barely vote, and laid you bare, a wishbone carved in your chest. In Waller County, they still segregate their cemeteries. They fired the police chief and then elected him sheriff. By July of that year, someone had started counting. 
So when they said suicide, we counted you number 63. We lose whole days accounting for everyone. I'm going to close with this last poem. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, this last poem is about Tamir Rice, and it's from the voice of Tamir, Tamir Rice when he's writing to the president, you know, not this one. Um, but, but <laughs> oh, wow. testimony for Tamir Rice. Mr. President, after they shot me, they tackled my sister. The sound of her knees hitting the sidewalk made my stomach ache. It was a bad pain. Like when you love someone and they lie to you, or the time Michaela cried all through science class and wouldn't tell anyone why. This isn't even my first letter to you. In the first one, I told you about my room and my favorite basketball team and asked you to come visit me in Cleveland or send your autograph. In the second one, I thanked you for your responsible citizenship. I hope you are proud of me too. Mom said you made being black beautiful again. But that was before someone killed Trayvon. After that came a sadness so big, it made everyone look the same. It was a long time before we could go outside again. Mr. President, it took one whole day for me to die. And even though I'm 12 and not afraid of the dark, I didn't know there could be so much of it. Or that there would be so many other boys here and so many names to remember. Unfortunately, um, most of us don't really listen. We are waiting to, to speak, to answer, you know. But if you ever go to a party someplace, I usually walk around myself and watch the crowd because um, you see all kinds of things there, you know. <laughs> all kinds of things that people like the one you see, I think they run across that face, you know. Most people don't really laugh all the time, you know, because the things that's in your life usually catches up, you know, and you really see who you really are. So this is, a lot of times, <coughs> I'll do things that respond to um, the way people are working that I've, I've seen. Like I've seen some things here, some artists that I've seen uh, nationwide that tend to do the same thing over and over and over again, okay? One person does, you can see it on TV, one person puts out a, a, a show and before you look, there's plenty of them. People just regurgitate it over and over again. So this, this started off as a part of the series of uh, Venus Salon. But I removed it from it. I would have been back to this house that we did this year. When I saw this, I thought that he had this game building it. And this is one of the few that's no reference at all in this one. You know, they do this with the face of the thing. Little picture like that, you know. So this is almost a few years up. I want to play around with uh, head ties, head dresses, you know. This one has one, this one has one, this one has one. If you see, it's also still a, a head tie, too great. An image of the flag runs across it and it covers the top of his head. It comes like a, a head dress also. And they are somewhat based loosely on uh, things you see in Africa. You see the way he can the head ties and beautiful stuff, you know. Uh, so this uh, airway, and the other thing I was, I was carrying around with a concept, you see a lot of writers now, you have pain, and you see the drips ones, the paint ones out of the thing. I thought it was, I thought it was, it was just, it, after a while, the first one does it, and everybody copies it, you know, and you stop being who you are once you keep copying, you know, so my position in, in my mind is, ever since I was a student, and I think you can talk about it, I tried to, to be as close to who I was. You know, I've never really studied how these guys work. The closest people that have influenced my work is probably here, lawyer, with content, solid, just how it's over painting, that kind of thing. You know, so when I saw that, I said, okay, let me do something like that, you know. But when I got started with it, I realized I didn't want to paint it, you know. So I started to try to build this, and how would I make it look like it was dripping and running? You know, so I end up with sort of a transparency, you know. This is just sitting kind of in front of the same just sticky paper, not sticky paper that one. But uh, the real thing is this, you know, so it's just like you said here. Here, how can you relate to this really strong and powerful woman? And these little things you see that 
the tree, things like that. That's that connection, connection that sort of out of strength, you know, and I try to, because there's nothing strong in nature, and the fact that we don't do something to kill us off, you know. But uh, there's nothing strong, so if you join the strength in that, you're going to get shot. You know? But I call this, uh, I think, with uh, my duties on that piece. And that refers back to a time where we were like, we were saying it starts there, how uh, black women were sometimes taken to the master bedroom, and the cross how we look, they were all into the house, and the cross how we look. And so this is, this is telling them that story that my beauty is not, it's not a bad thing, but it's not the extraordinary thing in that job. So it was maybe to talk about things like that. Um, this one here, what does that call it? It's uh, the road to freedom stops with one backward step. And I've asked the people, yeah, it's not very right, you know, but I think it is because I think the only way you want to go forward is to look back first if I move you up. You don't know who you are, you don't have a clue how you want to go forward. So that was what we talked about. That I used to send Copa for you there, and it's, she actually researched that. So if you want to go around with those things, she's actually a person. She does research. She does. So that was really a great thing we did. But uh, that means to go back and get it, you know. And that's in going back for who you are. This is a, this is a poem of Nina Simone. Nina Simone is, like I say, um, I've learned so much from Brittany. And as a student, I ran across Nina Simone. And what I liked about her, because she reminded me of my mother, you couldn't buy her. She used to be strong no matter what you did to her, she never came in. In fact, one of the ladies they talked about her, that she respected herself so much. Say you people out there, you're a little concert, and you guys are the audience. A couple of you out there talking, yeah, 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 running your mouth like that. And then we'll be up here playing on that, that piano, and she would look up, to walk out <laughs> and curse you out. <laughs> curse you out. I mean, it's just like, and she would sometimes say she won't find the minutes. Then she would come back, sit down, start playing, and get up and because she's still mad. <laughs> <laughs> she, she, was a, she was an amazing woman, and I, I like the fact that all of her music reflects that. Mm -hmm. Who she was. She never lied about that music. You know? I mean, these things here, this is something that. Sad to say, I'm guilty of you know, also. She's talking about the very stains of, um, of women of color, also the attitude, those kind of things. That. So you have one that's going to color black, tan, and brown. And I remember when we were kids, we, we said things like that. Too. <laughs> we didn't know. You know, it's ignorance, it's a, it's a powerful thing. You know? God, it's not. But, um, this, I did this to sort of commemorate that. I wasn't trying to say, I was trying to speak about everything she said I was saying. I was out of the attitude and how I failed myself, you know, but I didn't fail my girls ever, you know. I never let them get exposed to it without understanding, you know. But um, so these, these whole pieces was based on that concept of being a Simone. And if, if you haven't heard that song, you should go back and listen to it. You know, this, I mean, some people say, but she's not a great I'm like, God, you know, who cares? You know? <laughs> yeah, well, she was, she was just so much truth. They called you speeches. Of course, you know? That uh, when you, you felt it, you felt everything there. And I, I, I think it was probably one of the things that guided me in the show. Listen to our music. You know, you just see me kind of damn, you know. Uh, what's that one? I said, you know, the play trainer. You know, the, the ship. You know, oh man, it's just, just incredible stuff that she does. And she was not afraid. Not one second. In fact, one of her positions was that if you're not doing something that, that, that makes a difference, why are you doing it? You know, in the music, in the arts, you know. And I think eventually, when I decided to do that, we were going to take off because I think everybody in power knows that when the artist moves, the world moves. You know, because we don't control anything. We don't control the newspapers, the average person, we don't control the newspapers, television, none of that stuff, you know. But we control that voice we have. 